I'm Tom Ray, and this is American Bandito. Last week, I mentioned that I was helping one of our previous guests, Selma Carrion, sell custom hand-painted shirts. Here's how that's gone since then. We actually made a sale. Now let me back up and tell you kind of how this came about. So of course, first I mentioned it on this podcast. I also advertised it to Facebook and I set up some Google ads. Usually Facebook is good for promoting something, especially like this show, for instance. I've had a lot of success doing that. I've been able to find people that might be interested in it. Now, you may see something and go, that seems interesting, and hit like. Maybe even look at it. So there wasn't a lot of traffic for that particular thing on Facebook just because it was a buy this now sort of thing. So that's why I went to Google ads. Now those of course are ads that show up on websites. It's a little harder to try and find interested groups of people, but the advantage that Google has is people are searching for those things. So they're looking for them. They're actively trying to find the shirts, or at least that's what I was hoping for. People searching for shirts, custom shirts. So first I kind of had them show up on music sites, like maybe some band or an individual would want a shirt with their name painted on them. Now getting back to me announcing it on the show, the one sale we made was somebody who went to the URL that I mentioned last week, which is AmericanBandito.com slash CarryOnArt, C-A-R-R-Y-O-N-A-R-T. So I find that kind of a success. Since last week, the people that went to the page came to a total of 88. And out of those 88, three clicked the buy button to see more. And out of those three people, one person bought a shirt. That's pretty good for a custom-made t-shirt hand-painted product by an artist. Which, think about it yourself. How would you, in a small amount of space that you have to create an ad, tell people all that to try and get them interested in it? That's the fun thing about this experiment, is it's trying to find out how could somebody go, what Salma's making is actually really interesting and I want to go look at it. So that's the fun part about all this. Those are still available at AmericanBandito.com slash carryonart. Oh, and I almost forgot. It was gallery night this week in Madison. A bunch of the galleries around town open up their doors to the public and people can walk around and check it out. I went to the studio where I had told you about the painting class that I posed for. On the wall with a bunch of other things were some of the paintings that I posed for at that gallery that I had told you about. My wife was with me, she saw one of them, and decided to buy it. So we found the artist, she sold us the piece, and we now officially have a portrait of me that was done by a local artist in town here, in our house. This week on the show, I meet a woman who actually used to be a banker in Chicago. During that time... She went to school for jewelry making. After a while, she retired and decided to create her own boutique line. And what I find out is that she uses this to actually give back to some organizations that have helped her in the past. She's found a way to raise funds and to take some of the extra things that they have left over and donate them. So join me as I meet Hanifa DeBling. How do you say your name? It is Hanifa. Hanifa. Where does, what's the origin for that name? It is an Arabic word and it means true and upright. Wow. Mine's just Tom. <laughs> <laughs> well, I go by Hani. So people call me Hani because a lot of times people want to call me Hanny or Hannah. Okay. And I know a lot of people in my circles with Hannah is their first name. That's why I go by Hani. So it makes everybody, nobody gets confused. Okay. So are you from Madison or are you from this area? Actually, I'm from Chicago. Um, I moved to the Madison area in 2010, but my jewelry line began in 2004. How did you get started doing this to begin with? What brought you into making jewelry? Uh, how far back? Well, my mother was somebody who did a lot of sewing and a lot of, um, she actually did some beading. She used to make rosaries. And I kind of got into like watching her and playing with the sparkly things as a kid. And so it kind of was just something I grew up with. Her name was um, Christine and she always had 
done this kind of volunteer work for church and a very she was a very devout Catholic and so she would even do vestments for statues and, and get into that and make rosaries and chaplets you know I kind of just always did it um, but it wasn't until I took a trip to Soho my daughter was a few months old that I saw what they were selling for these you know necklaces and things that I just kind of gave as gifts and I thought you know what might be a good time to see if I could get started in a boutique and I did and I just took a bunch of stuff that I thought was just a hobby was selling on consignment like crazy and she taught you how to do this yes yeah and it's really the wire work the the beading it's not difficult you have to get the knack yeah she showed me all of it how would somebody get started in that like say somebody was interested in doing that so if somebody is already making jewelry or, you know, enhancing accessories, because we do things like lanyards and all kinds of good stuff. Oh, yeah. One thing to bear in mind is that you could give these things as gifts and get feedback from people. So one good example was one time when I had started to give things as gifts, I started experimenting with different types of clasps. A client, well, a gift a receiver tell me, well, you know, this, this itches in the back. And then I learned mm. nickel makes people allergic. Hmm. Getting to have people kind of test drive your work. You know, in my pieces, as you can see what I have on, they're kind of unusual and they work with heirloom pieces. Okay. But you can combine them and layer them. And I use sterling silver, gold fill, and 10 karat gold and genuine gems stones but I also show how to layer correctly because sometimes stones and different metals and alloys can damage other metals and make them deteriorate prematurely so I had done that I was accepted in a couple boutiques um, and then I started to do home parties home parties you mean like the yeah. Tupperware parties that they used to have when I was growing up it's very similar okay um, it bought Basically, you lay out a bunch of pieces, and I decided to pick a cause that I loved. You know, I donated a lot of my proceeds to that favorite charity. You got accepted into a boutique. Now, how do you go about finding boutique work? Well, um, the first one here in Madison was the iconic Hoi Polloi. Um, the owner actually, it was in Atwood. It closed a few years, a couple years ago. But one thing that I, I take away from that is to kind of look at the store and get the vibe of the store before you do anything or say anything. Mm -hmm. You know, look in, look in the store and say, hey, does my work fit into the, to the niche of this particular boutique? So you approach them? Of course, okay. yeah, I approach them. Um, what, I'll, what I like to do too is buy something that I can afford and really, you know, have a good interaction with the owner mm -hmm. and see, is this somebody who, wants to accept a new artist. I know that I've gone to places and sometimes you just think like this store has all this stuff. A lot of them are kind of segmented the way that antique malls were. I, I remember at Antiques, yeah. people would like rent a space. Right. In most artists, it's actually not a very good investment of money or time because you really do want to collaborate with the owner because you want that feedback mm -hmm. from the guests. For example, the boutique I was in at Hoi Polloi, I was learning that my price point between 48 and $100 was where I was really selling a lot. Hmm. Some of my less expensive items weren't. And having a great conversation with the owner and saying, what can I do, do you think, to make us more successful as a team? Mm -hmm. You know, is it about placement? Is it about lighting? Is it about mirrors? How do you display? Because if you're going to go into a store, you have to be prepared to display and you have to be able to be prepared to display in accordance with the store set. With some of the photos that you sent me, some of them looked like they were set up for presentations. So that's kind of almost an art form in itself. L like you had one that was attached, it was earrings, but they were hanging from a leaf. Yes, my Stavorsky, that's Anya. About 80% because like putting on a pair of earrings on a gigantic mannequin or face form mm -hmm. will not appeal. But when you're talking about size proportion, yes, that, it's critical. I'm assuming you're at the store putting on the Ritz is what it was called, right? Right. I manage putting on the Ritz here in Middleton. What does that store do? One thing that we do, um, it's a consignment shop. So basically okay. people bring their items to me to sell for them. Okay. And after 90 days, we probably donate our um, merchandise that our customers do not want to take back to Middleton Outreach Mission, yeah. Easter Seals, and DAIS in Dane County. What's DAIS? Domestic Abuse Intervention Services. Okay. So anyone who's suffered from trauma, the disruption of life, mm -hmm. that some, being with someone who is abusive can be, they provide, um, it's an outreach program within the county that is county funded, but we probably donate to them too. And, and to be honest, and not to get into too much of my my story, um, I was personally affected by domestic violence and financial abuse by 
two people that I thought I could trust. And once it happens to you, it's so jarring. Mm -hmm. And I receive services from both of DAIS and Middleton Outreach. Okay. And now that I'm in a position to give back, I'm so proud to. Yeah, that's great. With what you make, how do you find the inspiration for the pieces that you work on or find the pieces that you use? Well, it's funny that you mention that because I, in jewelry metalsmith school, I became fascinated with the work of Alexander Calder. Okay. And so I liked fluidity and movement within my pieces. And I'm very inspired by that organic, raw fluidity. And my spin on it is that I like to take classic pieces mm -hmm. that you may think are your aunt in, may have left you a very unusual, interesting, let's say, 80s piece of gold jewelry, right? Okay. And it's like, how do you modernize that without melting it down? And how do you incorporate it into your existing accessory repertoire? That is, is taking something that, you know, may be destined for melting in a refinery and bringing new life to it with other add-ons. Do you have a studio? Because you're talking about working with fire and welding, or not welding, but uh, look at me misusing the terminology. I don't know what the terminology you're is. You're not but, a metalsmith, are you? <laughs> no, I'm not. So I'm going to well, misuse all the words, but how about just saying the things that you need to do that I'm sure you need a space to do them in, do you have a studio for that? Uh, where do you do your work? What I'm working on now is actually out of my home. And we have proper ventilation to do most things. The big heavy machinery is something that if I wanted to t embark on another class, mm -hmm. I'd be able to do. But for what I'm doing at this point, the, when I'm the pieces I'm working on are so minuscule, you know, they're under 12 by 12 mm. in length. So really, with with silver cutting, silver copper, all of that, I could be it could be done at my workbench at home. How many pieces would you say you've done over the past? few years a oh, lot a hundred okay i, I was i wasn't sure how many you put out like what's the <laughs> I, I don't know what the turnover for for creating such things would be i mean i suppose if they're earrings or necklaces or other pieces of jewelry they can go fairly quickly so you probably got to keep demand up right you do so just depending on what people want and like then i could put it together quickly if you're doing things on consignment they're going to tell you like hey you're running out or you would go check to see that they're running out and kind of you'd have to be able to calculate what works or what you need more of and what you don't. Exactly. Do you ever you ever consider incorporating an assembly line? I'm fortunate enough to have a stepdaughter who is very interested in chemistry and in art. So she's really good at what she does at her level. But I do teach classes and I work with some youth that have mild forms of autism. It's a different method of coaching, you know, because you really shouldn't have more than one person. It has to be a one-on-one -on -one class. But, you know, for just charge a babysitter's fee, basically, you know, like 10 bucks an hour. Oh. And I, I don't know how to do stuff. How do people find you for this? Word of mouth lately. I have um, my Facebook page is Evie Designs and it's Honey Bling, H-A-N-I-B-L-I-N-G. Honey Bling is the one that kind of works with teaching classes and in at the charity projects I'm working on. Currently, I'm with DAIS until I'm fundraising for them, and I will be till November 30th. Can you describe what the other two are, aside from the teaching, the other design sites that you have on Facebook? So, Evie Designs basically is just an overview. Now, Evie Designs um, is one that accepts um, custom pieces. So, if a bride wanted to have a headpiece modified, I would be open to talking to her about being commissioned for something okay. one of a kind. That's kind of its overview. That was like the first, my first branch I opened. Then Bittersweet um, is the name of my line that was in local Madison boutiques. Okay. But Honey Bling is more um, class focused and charity driven. Do you put yourself out there? Do you advertise? I'm starting to because early on I made the mistake of ad of getting too out there and not being able to keep up with the demand. And I don't want to put anybody in a position who would rely on me for custom work mm. to be compromised. So for that reason, I decided to kind of slow down and make myself available for private commission pieces. How, did you find that out the hard way? Almost. It, it started with a pair of earrings that someone wanted custom done, but I learned that lesson. And thankfully, when it comes to a bride, you know, things when somebody's custom ordering a bridal headpiece or even bridesmaid jewelry, mm -hmm. they have an idea of what they want, but it works and it it's been successful and the reason it is is because I'm honest and I just say this isn't a job I can do at that price. It's not realistic, but I'm not the person for you to do this. You should go here. And I'm comfortable with it. I want somebody to be happy if they interact with me. Oh, and that's good that you're being honest like that and not trying to 
say that you can and then all of a sudden falling short. Right. I, I don't want a headpiece to collapse at the altar and have everybody know about it. That would be terrible for the bride and me. Or not have it ready at all. <laughs> With the different things that you are involved in, how do you manage the accounting or the taxes or do you just do it yourself or do you have a guy? Pretty much I've been doing it myself, but now that I, I'm I'm from Chicago and I got a guy. Okay. <laughs> but <good. laughs> But now he's helping me because it is getting to be a lot with how you know we're expanding and especially with what I'm doing here at, at Ritz. You know, it's like, well, how are we going to stay organized and do we need to have a third party kind of come in and make sure and stay on top of us? Because, mm -hmm. you know, when it was just Evie Designs and Bittersweet, you know, it was very easy for me to do just because of my financial background. I'm, I'm a retired um, bank examiner. So I have that understanding, but when you're running now three different subsects, it kind of is a good idea to have somebody ask you the right questions to keep you in order. Do you have online stores at all? I don't sell online. I promote online. I do not do Etsy. I have not I have not enjoyed my experience selling on Etsy. Um, a lot of people have been telling me that. Yeah, jewelry is something people want to touch it. People want to put it on. They want to see. It's an unnecessary beauty. Hmm. So with jewelry, I find that Etsy is a waste of my time because hmm. nobody's going to appreciate the workmanship that you feel mm -hmm. when you put it on. And if a piece is for somebody, it's for somebody. If it's not, it's not. I didn't want to do like wind up in a situation where you know I'm auctioning stuff on eBay and cheapening my brand uh. and lessening my brand. I like that you figured that out like right away. You're like, yeah, this isn't working, but you tried it. Right. Is there anything you'd like to mention that we may not have covered today? The, something coming up, projects that you have in the works, things that may not have anything to do with what we talked about today that you'd like to mention? Without any, any doubt, I think that it's important that we wish my beautiful daughter, who my company is named after, Evelyn Francis Jones, and I want to wish her an incredibly happy 14th birthday oh. um, from the store, because the girls at the store have not been able to send her a birthday card. Her birthday is on July 24th. Oh, sadly, this so. will probably come out way after that, but you know, the idea is there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I wanted her to hear from the store, happy birthday, but her birthday isn't until July 24th. The Ritz family, now the other managers, want to wish her a happy birthday. <laughs> okay. And who, who runs the Ritz? It's me. I'm a woman named Kristen. We work with the other owner, Diana Bongard. So the three of us work together. Um, we have another manager that comes in part-time here and there. So all of us kind of run this great ship we've got sailing. There's a thing Hanifa mentioned when she first started making her jewelry. She was just making it for friends. And during that time, they would give her feedback. Well, here's something I didn't mention when I was talking about Selma's shirts before. That shirt we sold, and I said I was trying to figure out how to market it. The person that ordered it from our site wanted Packers, Brewers, Wisconsin written on it. And then I thought, hand-painted sports logos. So I've been talking with Selma, and I said, have you ever thought of doing that? Now, it's her decision because if she doesn't want to paint sports-related things, she doesn't have to. These are hand-painted shirts. This is her art on a t-shirt. But sometimes you have to do things that are still in the realm of what you want to do, but maybe commercialize a little. For example, David Lynch, he makes commercials for television. He doesn't put his name on them. He doesn't tell people what they are, but he does that to help him fund the things that he wants to do. Another example was Orson Welles would appear in anything. He's in so many bad movies just because he would use that money to pay for his own projects. So I mentioned it to her and she actually thinks it might be a good idea. And I'll let you know how it goes. But somebody heard about it and said, oh, I would like this. And it opened up a whole new door. And also I want to thank Hanifa for taking the time to come on the show and talk with me today. And I really like the fact that she gives back to the community. Don't forget to subscribe to this show. It's available on Apple Podcasts and Google Play. You can also get email newsletters or subscribe to it on YouTube. And you can find out where the links to all those things are at AmericanBandito.com slash subscribe. And while you're there, you can read my daily comic journal called Then This Happened. The music for the show is by my side project called Romcom. And that's also available on the website at AmericanBandito.com slash music. I want to thank you all for listening, and there's more people to meet next week, so I'll see you then. So long. <laughs>